everyone thank you so much for joining us at home stage for any newcomers my name's Ellie and I'm the host of Garden Club a brief introduction for this evening um, we welcome Arthur Cole who's head of programs at the Newt in Somerset for an hour hello Arthur hello Ellie and hello everyone Arthur's going to tell us about the story to the splendid house and gardens at the Newt um, so I shall hand you straight over to him now enjoy Thank you, Ellie, and um, thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting me to chat and discuss um, this amazing place where I work. So I'm going to share my screen, um, and hopefully through the uh, magic of technology, we are there. Um, so the Newton Somerset, um, what is it and uh, where has it come from and where is it going? So really, over the course of this, uh, this uh, evening, I'm going to talk about past, present and future for this garden. And uh, Hadspen House has been on the map for quite a while. Um, in terms of horticulture, it is, um, it's been a significant garden since Victorian times, but really um, it's, it came into real fame in the 1970s with the great garden guru Penelope Hobhouse. Um, and we'll look at her influence on the gardens and how that has been interpreted now. So let's go back in time and um, look at who started it off because um, the house had been, the, the estate, there had never been a house there, but the estate had been um, part of larger estate, which was Castle Carey Estate. And then in the mid 1680s and 1685, um, a Gray's Inn lawyer uh, called William Player bought the estate and started building a house. And one of the first things he also did whilst building the house was to start planting the gardens. Um, Hadsford had never been gardened before 1690. It had always only been rather poor farmland. And then it went through some different um, uh, uh, owners. Um, Vicris Dickinson, this man in 1752, we'll come across him. We don't actually have a nice photo of him, but a, a nice picture of him. But he's the one that built the current house as we know it. And we'll look at that. Um, then a few others. And then the Hob Houses. In 1785, the Hob Houses arrived here. And then the current owners, Curse and Carl and Becker, arrived in 2014. Um, here's uh, Arthur, first Baron Hobhouse, um, who was, um, uh, he was uh, the man who married Margaret Hobhouse, fantastic Hobhouse, Margaret Hobhouse. She was a great gardener. Um, Arthur Hobhouse uh, was an MP much later on, and he's the one that set up the national park system. Now, the one in the centre here is Emily Hobhouse, and the newt was called Emily Estates until it was called uh, the New. So from 2014, we called Had, uh, was renamed Emily Estate after her. She was a suffragette um, who did a lot of work for the women and children during the Boer War. And um, the British Army were fighting a guerrilla warfare out in, um, uh, out in South Africa. And what they would do is they'd burn down the farm houses of the Boers 
so that the men couldn't return to them. Uh, and But in doing so, they made the women and children homeless and they only put them in very poor um, tents and dysentery and disease became rife. And uh, Emily Hobhouse campaigned here in Britain, then went out to South Africa to campaign against the treatment of the Boer women and children. And she is a, a heroine over there. She's a national hero. So back to Hadsman. The first garden, the first time gardening happened here was when William Pear bought the estate and he put the house in here. And this is one of the earlier maps that shows the developments that he put in. He planted up a lot of nurseries, probably because there were grants for this back then as they are now for planting trees, uh, mainly for the Navy. Um, and um, he then set about planting these avenues of trees. And you can see from this 2D map, the avenues spanning down here. Now this um, avenue would have been planted up mainly, the larger trees would have been elm. Well, of course, Dutch elm disease has um, killed off most of those elms. We replanted it with ash. Unfortunately, we've got ash dye back. But if I show you this, now here is the new house up here, right, which was built in the mid 18th century. You see, there it is. There, that's the new, that's the old house, a different house. In the mid 18th century, they built the new house. But you can see that this avenue of trees is the same. So that avenue exists, was planted in 1619, that avenue exists to this day. Um, and if you look from, so here is the new, here are the gardens, here is the, the Hadspen house, the new house built by Vic Chris Dickinson, mid 18th century. If you look out from that window, looking directly south, in the center of the house, this is looking out of the front door, the center of the house, you see the avenue here. So that line of trees that we see is that line there. So there was um, a, uh, a print, a, uh, a form that had already been laid down by previous generations. And the, the oldest part of the gardens is actually these lines, these lines of axes planted with trees. So you can see much more, much newer trees now, but still following that plan. Now, this is Vic Chris Dickinson's house, um, the uh, Hadsman house. Um, and in its time, uh, the house was considered um, screamingly modern. It was um, uh, it was a very modern new build house. And he set about opening up the gardens uh, because when Dickinson got there in the mid 18th century, the style was what we know as English landscape. And that, you know, the key people that uh, made English landscape gardens were people like Capability Brown, William Kent, um, Humphrey Repton. And they were all about getting rid of tight, uh, Italianate, continental style gardens and opening up large vistas, putting in ha-has, bringing the field in close to the house um and having these large sweeping rides and putting in lakes where there'd never been lakes it was opening up the countryside uh, rather than having close tied um very ornate gardens close to the house and we see this change in the gardening style here at Hadspen rather well now these uh rides up here these walks up here these are still these still exist to this day uh, even this mound up here. Um, and so we've kept a lot of this as it is now. And a lot of this has changed and we'll, I'll show you how that's changed now. So the Hob houses, they have been a significant influence on Hadspen. Uh, Henry Hobhouse II was the first Hob house to get here. And he was, um, uh, he was a, an avid, gardener, horticulturist. We know that because he kept very good archives. Um, he, uh, he was involved in small landscape uh, designs, the most notable one at Fine Court in the Quantocks, um, and he then would have wanted to continue that on here. 
we attribute one of the most recognizable features of the newt, which is the, uh, the parabola, which is the curved walled garden. Um, and we put that down to him. He would have gone away on, uh, on trips to Europe for the grand tour and been influenced by continental designs and continental thinking, but um, applied it in his own way back here. Now, the gardens didn't really have a huge change between, and I'll just jump back to him, between Henry Hobhouse II. Um, also, that shouldn't read, um, 1785, that should read, uh, why not? Uh, Margaret, Ho Margaret Hobhouse was the most notable second uh, gardener in here. She was fantastic. Um, she was very enthusiastic. She was very energetic, like a lot of Victorian people were and um, she transformed the house, really. Um, she employed six gardeners, um, a huge sum in terms of wages. Um, she put in terraces. Um, uh, she stuck in a, a, a huge square Victorian uh, bathing pond. Um, she commissioned a very sophisticated glass house um and put in rockeries and fountains and she was just a, a a fantastic horticulturist and her legacy remains here in a lot of the features of the garden but also some of the trees that she planted there's a a wing nut by the main house that she planted that back then would have been a very rare tree to have had in the in the country and she um, this is this probably suggests that she had um, connections to Q, or it perhaps even um, supported some plant collecting expeditions, um, because you wouldn't just have um, these. You, should, you wouldn't be able to just go and buy these trees. They were very rare at the time. Um, so there's a nice little clue as to her interests. The glass house. Well, unfortunately, we have no photographs, uh, even early photographs of the glass house. All we have in the archive are the plans. Um, but we can see from the plans that they are uh, ambitious and that this was built. She actually spent, uh, she turned a lot of it over to vines, but she would have had ornamentals uh, in there too. Um, we plant we've built a glass house on its um on its foundations it's roughly the same uh, size um we're not growing vines or peaches in it we are growing things like um uh, birds of paradise and sago palms and other tropical species so the war garden well the first war um took its toll on many of these great houses gardens um, any of you who know the Lost Gardens of Heligan will know the story that's behind that. The Lost Gardens of Heligan down in Cornwall, they, um, uh, they were a great Victorian garden with lots of gardeners. The gardeners went off to war and unfortunately a lot of them didn't come back. And that meant that these gardens turned into jungles and the, um, the exotic plants that had been brought over by the Victorians went wild. And you have this extraordinary um, rewilding using um, uh, species that had never been, in, you know, seen in Britain before. And suddenly, then over the next couple of decades, they, they almost take over this garden. Well, the garden here at Hadspen um, suffered from the war. Um, because uh, the gardeners went off to war. Uh, many of the uh, established trees were felled. The, um, the grass was ploughed up um, to be planted with potatoes. Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was devastating on the garden uh, in terms of for the, for the war effort. It was devastating uh, for the garden itself. And the lost garden, well, um, Margaret died in 1921, arguably of a broken heart, um, and uh, because of the toll that the war took on her family and of the garden. Um, and the, the gardens then fall into sort of disrepair. 
Um, there, there's nothing really of any kind of note in terms of um, uh, building upon the work that Margaret have done. Until Penelope Hobhouse arrives. So Penelope arrives, she marries, um, her name, uh, she married a Hobhouse and um, arrives at Hadspin in 1969. She started reading about Margaret's garden and was fascinated by what Margaret had done for the garden in Victorian times. And um, she, Penelope then wanted to bring back a lot of this and she wanted to restore it. Unfortunately, she didn't have six gardeners. She had one gardener, Eric Smith, who was an amazing uh, plant breeder. In fact, you can see a lot of his work in seed catalogues all around the world now. There are things such as, um, you'll see the name Hadspin around the place, things like um, uh, Hosta Hadspin Blue and Anemone Hadspin Abundance and um, uh, uh, lots of lots of hadspins coming in onto the seed catalogues, um, and that was Eric, um, who, was an, who was an amazing plant breeder. Um, so he worked with uh, Penelope to create, try to recreate Margaret's garden, um, and she then wrote her books, very famous books like The Country Gardener, um, here while she was at Hadspin. So a lot of the plans that are in those books are actually based on the garden here at Hadspen. You can see this is the lily pond here, and um, uh, there is the cottage in the background. We'll come back to this cottage, and you can just see its, its tiled roof here, um, a Scots pine in, in the background, um, uh, a meta sequoia uh, glyptostroboides, which is otherwise known as the dawn redwood, which was thought to be extinct until um, after just after World War II, when it was discovered in uh, China by two botanists, and um, they realised that it wasn't a fossil, and they only had fossil records before now. It wasn't a fossil. This thing was alive, and now you see them planted all around the place. But this um, this shows the garden as in its kind of uh, looking slightly woolly around the edges, but it was full of life. Then come the late 80s, the garden went through a different transition and um, it, were, it became one of the most photographed gardens in England. And that was under uh, the Pope's, uh, Nori and Sandra Pope, an amazing plants, a Canadian plants couple who came as tenants to live at Hadspen and they took over the garden. And you can see from this, uh, a page in their book um, called Colour by Design, which is still a very influential book today, a really great book, um, about how they're using block colours um, and different shades and hues to move um, to temperature around the garden. And they were, they were a fascinating plants couple, um, and you can't really think about Hadspen without, without paying homage to the Popes. Um, and this is, um, so we've we've paid homage to the popes and we've got a couple of color gardens here as well so the gardens as they stand now and we are looking from the east we're looking from the southeast here so north here um south here uh east over here and west over here so um there is the house the main house and the gardens then start to spill down what we call the long walk um, down east through what we call the kitchen garden here uh, with its very uh, square beds um, and then the other features of the garden well if you arrive as a guest you park your car uh, where my um, cursor is behind this line of trees and then you walk through the woodlands and you come to this enormous threshing barn, otherwise known as a tithe barn, um, which is a medieval design, but actually we, we built it from scratch a few years ago. And then you come into the courtyard and this is sort of the visitor hub. Here's where you can get your coffee and whatnot. Here is where we make cider. And here the London plane trees is where you can sit under in the shade and drink your cider. And then this is that walled garden. So if I just jump back to the Pope's book, there is this very 
recognizable D shape, the walled garden, and there it is again. Um, so in here is our, as we call it the parabola, um, and in there is where we host most of our apples, which we'll get to. This is the glass house up here, um, and that's where we've, this, the main part of the glass house is the tropical house, and just behind, just below it, behind this wall here, is the arid house. And then we have the Victorian beds here. We've got the cottage garden up here. And then we've got what we call the cascade beds that come down here. We've got a very contemporary grass structure here, uh, grass plantings here. And then this Victorian bathing pond here. And then out here, we've got the, um, uh, the open parkland, what we consider the English landscape part. So we're coming closer on these, but the the journey is that when you turn up you come down into the parabola and we've made in here the design is a very formal italianate baroque style garden and it's a maze and um it's very tightly clipped and it's similar to what you would find of the geometric designs in gardens at that period that would have been copied from Europe and then applied in Britain. So that's why we start, because um, the house, not this house, this house, the, the original house was built here. It was torn down by Vicarus Dickinson and this new Georgian Palladian mansion built in its stead. But when he came in 1690, he that's when he started uh, planting gardens. So that's why we want the journey to start off in 1690 in here, which is why we've given it a 1690 Baroque style to it. And then the, then the, the journey continues. As you head down here, you look out into English landscape, and that was the second thing that came along. As you go through the Victorian beds, you then move up through a little gap in the wall here into the cottage garden. So you've gone from Victorian times into an arts and crafts period, so into just before the Great War. So there's a, there, there's, um, a, a chronology that, that ties the gardens together. So we're going to sort of imagine that we've turned up to the visitor car park and we're going to walk through the gardens. So this is the first thing that hits you once you come through the ticket office. It's an oak slat boardwalk that uh, meanders through the woodland. Um, and the established woodland on either side we're working on, uh, apart from this uh, uh, sequoia dendron here, we're working on keep, keeping this, um, all of the woodland here to a time. And that timeline is um, actually um, 1690. So we're keeping to 1690 for the woodland here as well. So then you come into the threshing barn. Well, this is a picture of um, some of the things we get up to here. We have uh, different events. We'll get onto that later. But the threshing barn, as you can see here, it is constructed um, in a similar way to a medieval um, threshing barn. These are oak, this is all oak. Um, and the nave here, there's nothing that hasn't been used that the medievals wouldn't. So enormous oak dowels that tie these beams together. And then this strange looking, these strange looking beams, uh, well, not beams, but these strange looking pipes here, are actually a modern art installation uh, and it moves. We call it the flying newt and it, um, it uh, sort of flies over the top of your heads as you, as you walk into the, um, into the threshing barn. Uh, we use three main types of stone on the estate. Anyone who's been to Somerset and especially down to Castle Cary will be familiar with this golden stone. It's um, colloquially known as Cary stone. It's um, a uh, it's a brashy type of stone. It was laid down uh, about 160 million years ago. So it's a limestone which often has huge ammonites in it. And then there's the blue lias. Anyone who's been watching anything to do with the southwest last week will have uh, seen that a huge part of the coast is just um, a big landslide has happened uh, at a place called Eep, where a lot of the coast has just fallen into the sea. And that's the Jurassic Coast. So um, uh, bad for dog walkers, that landslide, but good for paleontologists who will now be sifting through it, looking for dinosaur bones. The glass house. Uh, so in the glass house, it's a Victorian design, but again, we built it. Um, we built it on the same base as Margaret Hobhouse's uh, glass house. 
Um, we've got a 250-year-old Cycad in there, but we've also got these, which are wonderful. Um, this is Agave Victoria Regina, so Queen Victoria's Agave. These are enormous. And they start off very small, they grow rather rather large. They come from uh, Central um, America, so around Mexico. And they, after about 40 years of growing up from this into this, they begin to sprout a flower. And they send up a flower spike that takes about two weeks to reach this enormous height. Um, and once it has flowered, it sends out this uh, these uh, profusion of these yellow flowers. And once they get pollinated, the whole plant then dies. So it spends 40 years to get to a flowering period. And once it does flower, it only takes a few weeks and then the whole plant dies. Quite tragic, really. And then the fern is on the outside. So we've just, we've, if we were to go through these glass doors, um, and out through the other glass doors, uh, you can't quite see them, but just through there. You come out through these glass doors, you then come out of here. That's that's where the glass house is, where my pointer is, behind these ferns. And you come out into these ferns. Now, the fernery here is, is um, exposed, it's outside, but it's quite sheltered enough uh, to grow ferns from Fiji, from uh, Tasmania, uh, we've even got ferns from Zambia in there. So it's amazing what you can achieve if you um, if you create enough shelter to, to allow these things to grow. The parabola, well, um, this is uh, this is the our, our apple maze that I was talking about. So there's the glass house that we've just been in. So imagine we've come out of the glass house and we go through the parabola. Uh, the parabola has, um, uh, it is a maze, and actually if you're in a wheelchair or you had a pram, you'd be able to get to every single part on these paths without going up or down the steps. So you see lots of steps here, but the, the, the maze works in such a way that you can get to every little part um, without having to go up or down a step, which is a good uh, design feature in itself. This lower um gate here um it's you can't quite make it out from the uh from the picture but this is on a on actually quite a steep slope the high point being up here and the low point being down here and there's always been a gate down at this bottom corner and the reason for that is that frost flows like water and in a walled garden you don't want frost hanging about so this is sort of like a sluice gate for the frost they always had it here because the frost would then flow down the hill here flow down the inside of the and it would be allowed out to spill out here so we've got over um we've got 296 different cultivars of apples and they are predominantly English cultivars, and we've arranged them by their county. Um, so the title of the collection that we've gone for is um, Pre-1930s Malus Cultivars Arranged by County. I don't think there are a lot of people going for that title, so I, I don't think there are many contenders for it. There are over, there are over 2,500 apple cultivars in the world. The produce garden is all organically um, gardened. Um, we're not organically certified, but we practice organic methods. We don't spray any nasties. We uh, have minimum till. Um, we have companion planting to help beat off the pests. And we follow crop rotation, uh, BLA, which is brassicas one year, legumes the next, alliums the year after that, and roots the year after that. And that helps to fox the pests and prevent them from coming back. Um, we do a lot of edible flowers. So this is um, uh, edible flowers, one of the edible flower beds. And all of these flowers from the Californian poppies to the nasturtiums to uh, even salvias in there are all edible. And um, some of them probably don't taste that you know, amazing, but they certainly liven up the look of a salad. The Victorian bathing pond was put in by Margaret Hobhouse. It's reserved for newts use only, apart from for staff parties when everybody's had a few too many ciders. Um, and it's home to all three of the native newt species. We've got um, uh, great crested newts, smooth newts, and palmate newts. 
And to get rid of the algal blooms that come in the summer, we have algae eating microbes that we apply, which don't touch any of the other organisms or weeds in there. Uh, they just uh, attack that nasty blanket weed and leave it crystal clear for everything else. It's an amazing, uh, amazing thing. The colour gardens, well, these are an homage to the popes and their colour wheel. And it's all about seasonal successional planting, good structure and movement. The movement comes in using steeper tenuissima, steeper gigantium. Um, but we also put in silvers from things like the cardoons um, to really help offset the red. Here's the blue garden and we use um, hazel wattle uh, fencing, which keeps these gardens really uh, very warm and it means that we can grow a lot of tender things and leave them out that we can't in other areas of the garden. And then there's the white garden in sort of midsummer, um, absolutely bursting uh, with um, uh, different roses. There's great rose in here, Kew Gardens, which I'd suggest to anybody thinking about what rose should they have, go for a Kew Gardens. They flower almost all the way through the year. This one didn't stop flowering until January this year. And that's all the way through the winter, just going all the way through. Um, here's a portal looking through. Then the cascades. The cascades are one of my favourite parts of the garden. They have these pools that drop down into each other. And the planting on either side is bog planting. Um, we've put a lining in the beds and that means it retains a lot of the water. The plants then uh, get to keep their feet wet and we have start off with uh, geums and um, follow on with um, irises. We've got great regersias in there, um, uh, different primulas. We've got um, uh, loose strifes, meadow sweets, dioramas. It's like a slow... Uh, it's like a slow firework explosion that starts off in May and doesn't finish until about um, uh, October. So here's a comparison. Here's April last year. We're a bit further behind this year. It's been quite a slow April. And here's July. You just see that weight of the herbaceous coming out. A Victorian bedding. Well, we've got Victorian beds. I'm not a huge fan of Victorian bedding. Um, it always seems to me very far too formal, but that's very much what the Victorians were about. They were um, they felt that nature had got it wrong and that they were going to tidy nature up. And there's the uh, so that's it. Looking at it now, we've got these tulips and these wallflowers with these forget me nots. And then this is the summer bedding, which is salvias and, and elysium. And there's the cottage garden. And the cottage garden is really talking about the arts and crafts movement, uh, Gertrude Jekyll. And we've got great herbaceous planting in there. Um, and this is really well kept. As soon as something goes over and we don't, you know, it's starting to yellow or it's going to set seed, we cut it back. We don't do that in all the gardens, just in this one, because it's pretty much how Gertrude used to garden herself. There's another look at it. The mile pit. The mile pit's an interesting part of the garden. It was dug in the 17th century and they're, it was, they're dug, you've got them in Norfolk, and the nutrient-rich mile, which is like a clay, is extracted and then spread over the fields. Um, and they stopped used doing that uh, thing now. And we actually use this as, um, as a storytelling area. You come in and we talk about the Arthurian legends because being in Somerset, very much Arthur's County. We've got some sket beehives there. You can see where the pointer is. Um, and uh, it's talking about a, a time of Somerset, uh, perhaps uh, only, forgot, only remembered in legend. The Stumpery is quite fun. It's a fantastical world of uh, J.R. Tolkien-esque inspired um, uh, stumps. We like to feel that it's where the elves would meet. Um, the stumps have been sourced from the estate. They've been have power blasted off and they create these extraordinary um, features in the garden. We planted up with ferns and um, cardiocrinums and um, it's quite a fun little playground to run around and get lost in. Then the Viper, this is an aerial walkway. Um, it um, gets you about 40 feet up into the, um, into the canopy of the trees. And um, there's one in Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens, there's one at Kew, and there's one in, um, at Westonbert. 
Um, and it's fascinating. You get to be up among epiphytic ferns and, and butterflies. It's a really, it's a great feature. And the future, well, we've spoken about the past, where we've come from. We've spoken about where we are now and where are we going? Well, we're going here. Oh, they just cut off the top. But the story of gardening. This is our garden museum, but it's a very interactive museum. It's a very, uh, it's, um, we like to appeal to all of your senses here. And um, it's made up of nine different rooms in this part here. So as you, behind the big screen, this stretches down the room and it's subterranean. So you can see out of here, but actually it's dug into a hillside. The hillside comes down here and it's, it's so under the hill. And um, you go through the rooms, you go into gardens of uh, Roman gardens, gardens of the Far East, and all the way up to gardens of the future. Um, each room has its own scent and sound and light and touch. And it's, um, oh, it's a fascinating place to be in and, and um, a, a great way to, to look at gardens when, when you're underground, really. Um, so this is another look. You see these are the different rooms here. And we've got a tool wall here, which um, charts the evolution of different gardening tools all the way down to the end. What else have we got? Well, we like to develop the team here. So here's Sam, who um, uh, was working in the kitchens, but has always been fascinated by horticulture, did a bit of horticulture, and he's now working in the nursery. Um, uh, and working with other members of the food and beverage team who want to become gardeners. So we're stealing food, we're stealing chefs and, and waiters and turning them into gardens. And of course the cider, we make a lot of, well, we make not a lot of cider, but we make good cider here. Um, we've got 3000 cider apple trees and we've got 70 different varieties, which allows us to play around with lots of different um, tastes. You can see all of these tanks have a different type of cider in them. The farm, we've got British white cattle in North Norfolk. There's a great, um, uh, Diana Burbeck had um, a very famous herd of these beautiful uh, British white uh, cows. Uh, these guys have just been let out of the barn over winter, so they're still covered in their muck, but they get, they whiten up very quickly. Um, we've got sheep. Um, these are, um, uh, these are a French breed called Bleu de Maine, and we cross them with a uh, Dorset, uh, Dorset down to give them hardiness. And um, so we're rearing our own, our own lambs. Uh, we've got the restaurant, the Garden Cafe sits very snugly in this woodland setting. That's the inside of it. So you sit in there and you look out across the gardens. There's the hotel. Um, it's got 23 bedrooms in here and the stable yard. And then we've got an, another kind of offsite hotel that we just uh, turned an old farmyard into as well. And there's a restaurant in it. Uh, you see you've got big glass over the top, so you're, you're covered. And then we do things like wassails. It's a West Country apple tree toasting ceremony. And here you can see um, the king um, with, uh, we, we put our own slant on it and we, we get um, a civil uh, recreation society in. And you pour cider on the roots of the tree and hang toast, uh, cider toast up in its boughs uh, to encourage the good spirits into the, the tree to give you a good harvest. And we fire off a few cannons as well to scare off the bad spirits. And we sometimes get in these um, <laughs> pagan looking uh, fellows um, for a bit of a dance uh, to also encourage you in good spirits and push out the bad and also to drink a lot of cider with. And the other one that we like to really celebrate is Apple Day. Apple Day happens on the 21st of October and um, uh, it's just a good excuse really to celebrate apples and to drink cider and have games. And this is our tunnel um, covered with apples. And the past, well, the reason we come to the past is we've unearthed a Roman villa and we've excavated it. Um, it's going to be here. Uh, this is a, a plan of it, but it will be ready by the end of this year. And we've constructed a replica next to it and you walk around the replica and it's as close to being in a, a Romano-British villa as, um, as anyone's able to provide. And uh, the gardens are going to be as true to what the Romans would have had. 
And anything else? Well, you will just have to come and see for yourselves. That, everybody, is the end of, um, of that uh, exhibition. Thank you so much for your patience through that. Um, I can see there's been a few questions whilst we've been on there. Uh, like I say, sorry for the technical hitches there. I'm, I'm better off in the garden than I am in front of the computer. <laughs> you did excellently well, though, all things considered. Um, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. A huge amount of information to um, absorb and a really fascinating story. And so much to see and do there. Um, I, I can't see that a couple of hours would do it. No, um, no you're right. You're absolutely right, Ellie. Um, the, the, idea, the idea really is to come and come for a weekend and just immerse yourself in it because... We, it's a it's a real journey. It's a it's a journey. It's a cerebral journey at the same time as being able to touch and feel and taste the gardens. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, let's have a look. A couple of questions. Um, the landslide. <laughs> You mentioned the landslide on the south coast. Where was that? Yes, yeah, so um, down at Eep, E Y P E, and there was a, la a huge landslide there um, last week or, or just the week before. Um, so, really beautiful Jurassic Coast, um, classic Dorset coast. Um, a big part of it uh, fell into the sea um, just over a week ago. And uh, the reason I was talking about that was that that stone that makes up the Jurassic Coast um, uh, is Blue Lias, and that is that was laid down between 205 and 180 million years ago. So that's where all of these dinosaur bones are. So um, that landslide is going to show a lot of, of dinosaur bones here on the estate where we use that stone. We still we get a lot of the fossils in in the stone so as it's cut we get to see these ancient ancient um creatures coming out of the stone so it's a uh, it's you're, you're walking in amongst um 200 million years of history incredible stuff isn't it um, um i see that uh, on the on the on the questions board here um We've got uh, Virginia Williamson has said it looks fantastic. And how can one visit the gardens? Uh, Virginia, in answer to your question, um, uh, just, uh, well, you can just go onto the website and that gives you all the information you need. Uh, we tend to like people to buy their tickets first uh, online uh, because of COVID. And it means that it's just a streamlines the thing. Um, so, but you can get lots of information on that on the website. Um, uh and come and see us soon because hopefully everything's going to be opening up soon so come come and grab it um also come at any time of the year i mean the great thing about gardens is that they're constantly evolving and changing and they're never the same from one week to the next they change from um from from day to day from week to week month to month season to season year to year so i um uh, anyone can make a garden look good in spring and summer uh, the real trick is managing to inspire and delight uh, in a garden in the off season. And I like to think that that's what the team here have managed to do. You can come in the middle of winter and it can be so dreek and so dour outside. And yet there are aspects of the garden that still um, fascinate and intrigue and draw you a bit further along the path. Excellent. Yeah. There's uh, another question that I can see. Um, two questions actually from Tricia Ridge Ridgeway. I think you mentioned the apple trees are in the frost pockets. Does the frost impact the blossom? Hugely so, Tricia. Yes. Um, the uh, the frost um, the frost has played merry havoc with our uh, magnolias. So if any of you um, like us here have, um, uh, I mean, ours are Magnolia stellata, which are the beautiful uh, starburst uh, magnolias. They came out expecting to have really good flowering and they were, they flowered so well. And then we had a late frost and they've practically all gone brown. Um, the blossom 
Thankfully, the blossom has been held back longer and we haven't yet had the frost to hit them. Um, it would affect um, uh, the blossom. It would uh, reduce the chance of it be of them being pollinated and then thus it would reduce the, them turning into apples. Um, but because they're in that parabola, which is on a, um, a gradient and it's got that gate at the bottom that I was pointing out, the sluice gate, um, that allows that frost to move away from the, the blossom, then it doesn't linger too much. So that's really the, uh, a really uh, beneficial design feature to the, um, to the parabola. Excellent. Um, Trisha's second question, how long do the wattle fences last before they need replacing? All looks fantastic and I can't wait to visit later this year. Uh, very good, Tricia. We, we look forward to uh, welcoming you. The wattle fences, parts of them, uh, it, it, you're working with a very organic, untreated material. So uh, parts will last longer than others. Um, those have been in now for three and a half years and they are holding up well. The parts that don't hold up so well are just the the finer details in the windows in the wattle, which were the um, uh, the oval shaped um, portals in there. And those have been lined with much thinner willow. Those haven't really stood up to the winters so well, and those are gonna need to be replaced. Parts of the wattle um, are starting to become a bit more brittle, but you know, it's also in a pretty sheltered spot itself. If you put wattle on a really exposed uh, hillside that's going to get battered by wind and rain, it's not going to last very long. Um, where they are at the moment, uh, which is south facing, it's got trees to the north of it. I reckon we've got quite a while left in them. Great. Um, a uh, question here from Sophie Henderson. How did you find out about the Romano Villa? Ah, so um, so the Roman Villa actually was discovered back in 1966 when one of the Hobhouses was here. They started excavating it, um, but the time and inclination and money wasn't there to continue, so they covered it back up. Um, when the current owners got here, uh, they were fascinated by the story. And we got in touch with the Oxford um, archaeology uh, company, uh, basically retired Oxford Dons. And um, they work on a lot of the significant archaeological finds around the world. And they uh, took our case. They thought it sounded fascinating, too. And the excavations resumed. Um, after you know 50 years and um we first i think the back in 1966 they first heard, thought about it because there had been quite a lot of roman activity around here um and the there was corrugated hillsides behind where the villa is which suggested um that they'd grown vines there so having grown vines there that's that must have been a roman thing because nobody had been growing vines there since roman times um, which also suggests that the climate might have been a bit different back then as well uh, to be able to, to grow those vines. So that's how we got onto it. Excellent, thank you. Um, I've got a question actually. Um, I heard the, the name caterpillar used um, earlier last year when I was reading about the newt. Is that, do you, is that not called the caterpillar anymore? Are you just calling it the tunnel? Ah, so... <laughs> You're, you're right to pull me up on that. So that so the caterpillar is that tunnel which has the um, uh, which has the the apples on it. In fact, I don't know how I pull that up, but um, uh, uh, it is. So we we call we call the the caterpillar um, the we call the the that tunnel. Uh, the caterpillar you're right to call it the caterpillar um it's going to be growing gourds up it so it's a metal frame that's very bulbous and um we're going to grow gourds up the side of it and then the gourds will droop through and dangle uh through as people walk through it and hopefully it kind of discombobulates you it it, it puts you into a different frame of mind it is going to feel quite alien and so by the time that you come through the tunnel 
you feel that you've probably traveled further than you really have. It's just quite a clever way of turning a short walk into cerebrally quite a large walk. Yeah, it's a fabulous idea. It really stuck in my mind. Um, do you know how many different varieties of um, pumpkin and gourd you'll I, attempt to grow? Um, I don't know how many exactly, but one of the ones that's going to be I suppose the centerpiece and the poster child for the gourds is one called a tromboncino. Um, go and look up the tromboncino. It's it's like it's named as 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 it suggests. It looks they're the most extraordinary looking gourds, um, and it's it's a it's like a it's a it's a courgette that's turned trying to turn into a trom into a trombone fascinating looking thing um and we're going to have a whole month dedicated to these things <laughs> fantastic um i guess there are only so many that are climbers anyway that you could um select from exactly exactly and um uh, really we need we need this summer to really up the uh up the temperature because we're live i would say we're about two weeks later than we were last year uh, yeah. Last this time last year, a lot of the garden was already in flower. A lot of it was really up, and we've noticed that this very cold, um, this very cold April has really held a lot of things back. Yeah. So you did a trial run with um, the pumpkin growing, gourd growing last year, did you? Well, we've got, um, we've, we're very lucky, we've got um, an off-site um, kind of, but not really glass houses, but they are what, what's called Kida houses, which is essentially a, um, uh, a polytunnel, but the polytunnel uh, material is made out of um, a kind of a reinforced bubble wrap. So it's a, it lets the light through, but it is, um, it's insulated. And we've got quite tall ones of those. And so we grow, we grew a tromboncino, um, a tromboncino uh, forest through the center of it. And they worked really well. And we were only growing them as a bit of a laugh, but everybody seemed to, um, everybody seemed to really love them, uh, hugely so. So we're actually going ahead and, and naming a month. We're gonna have August as tromboncino month here. <laughs> love that, that's fantastic. Well, um, we're at eight o'clock already. Um, huge thanks for your time, Arthur. That's such um, a fascinating story to tell us um, about the newt and the gardens. Um, I shall try and get there as soon as I can make such a long trip. Um, for, uh, before we leave, if uh, our viewers have enjoyed this event and would like to be notified of all future guest speakers, um, please hit the subscribe button on if you're watching via YouTube. Um, and our website uh, address to sign up is on the bottom of the screen. Um, we look forward to welcoming everybody soon. And many thanks again, Arthur. It's really kind of you to share your time with us. Well, thank you, Ellie. And, um, and thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you in the garden soon. Come visit us. Come and see what we're up to. We all will en masse <laughs> when it's not raining. Very good. Thanks very much.